My name is Shannon Wolf, and on behalf of the Historical Commission, I would like to welcome you to our annual speaker series. We are honored to have Professor Geyer return to us tonight to speak about the architecture here in our city. Dale Allen Geyer is an associate professor at Lawrence Technology, at Lawrence, excuse me, Lawrence Tech, where he teaches classes in architecture history and theory. He is an adjunct professor of historic preservation at Goucher College and co-director of a master's thesis program. Professor Geyer's research focuses on American architecture in the 19th and 20th century, and he has published two books. For this lecture, the Historical Commission thought it would be fun not just to look at the exterior features of our houses in the city, but some internal ones as well. We are most grateful to George and Loretta Lenko, Jim Luzinski and William Hartman, and David Franzen and Mark Brissani for inviting Professor Geyer into their homes. Thank you all for coming out tonight and enjoy the presentation. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Now, could we have these lights off and a little bit more on in the back? Oh wait, that's my work. Is this good? Okay. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank the Historical Commission for having me back. Uh, it's a nice opportunity to come to places like this and have such a great turnout. I've given conference papers at academic conferences that had far less of an audience uh, than this. <laughs> So it just uh, sort of reinforces the impression that I have of uh, Pleasant Ridge as a community of people who really care about their community and their architecture. And so uh, coming here twice now to give these kinds of lectures and seeing so, such a great turnout really gives me hope for other communities around here. Uh, I know I shouldn't start by making apologies, so I'll make some explanations before I get into the body of what I'm going to do. Uh, first of all, I'm going to concentrate on the houses in the original historic district. So for those of you who live on other streets, uh, I'm sorry, but in the efforts of trying to condense the talk, and plus I got some really good survey information on those original historic district houses that I was able to work with. So I don't want to short anybody uh, if I don't show your house, it's just in the interests of time. Uh, second. Uh, if you happen to see your house in a photograph uh, and it doesn't quite look like it looks now, that's because uh, the, some of the photos, well, almost all the photos I'm using are a few years old. Uh, it seems that in the last month, every time that I tried to get out here to take photographs, it was rainy or it was cloudy, uh, the sun wasn't out, and so I ended up going with some older photos. And uh, just today, as I was looking through them, I thought, boy, I, I hope people haven't really changed the exteriors of their houses very much. But if you happen to see your house and it doesn't look quite the same, that's the explanation. And uh, finally, I also want to thank the homeowners who invited me into their homes and, and let me poke around and take photographs. And um, Unfortunately, uh, it, the talk that I'm going to give today is going to be more broad and more general about uh, sort of architectural developments in America and how they're reflected in Pleasant Ridge. But so I couldn't really use a lot of the information that I gathered on these trips, but I'm thinking that in the future I'd like to come back and focus in more on specific stories. So maybe grab six or seven individual houses and really get in depth with them, sort of give people a, an architectural tour and a history and talk about the ownership and, and that sort of thing. Okay, and I also would like to thank, before I begin, uh, Leslie Edwards, who's going to operate the uh, slides for me here today since my arms aren't quite long enough to reach the computer to advance them. Okay, uh, what I want to do tonight is to talk about the architecture of Pleasant Ridge and explain where it came from in, in some pretty general terms. Or in other words, as I said, I'm not going to get into individual stories of owners and houses and construction dates and that sort of thing, uh, but I will give a brief history of Pleasant Ridge and then I will try to contextualize these houses so that you get a sense of you know, where the styles came from for the particular houses of this community and 
what they're trying to reflect both outside and inside. And it's great that, uh, as we'll see, I have some good graphics coming up here in a few minutes. It's great that the bulk of the houses in Pleasant Ridge really were built in the 20s and 30s. Uh, because that is right in a major revolution in American domestic architecture. It's sort of the tail end of a series of developments that begin in the late 19th century that shape almost all the houses in this community. So I thought it might be interesting and informative to kind of go through those developments so that then you can maybe take these general uh, historical facts and maybe apply them to your own house when you go home this evening. So my talk's going to be divided into three parts, really. The first part will be a brief history of Pleasant Ridge. And for those of you who already know the history, uh, my apologies, it won't take too long. Uh, for those of you who don't, I think it provides a good background for looking at the particular architecture. Then I'm going to survey the styles that are pre pre present in Pleasant Ridge. <laughs> and but that, I didn't think that would be so tough. And uh, give you a little bit of background as to what they're supposed to mean and where they came from. And then the third part, I want to talk about some, uh, some changes in American society that really drove major changes in American domestic architecture between about 1880 and 1930. And you can see that reflected in your individual houses. OK, so part one, history. Can everyone see the screen OK? Well, I, I don't know why I asked that, because there's nothing I can do about it. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, but it is focused, so that's good. And if I get too loud, um, it's because I'm used to lecturing in a cavernous auditorium and without a microphone. And so I have to really throw my voice out to my students. Uh, and I found that sometimes when I try to translate that to a microphone, it, it gets a little blaring. So if I get too loud, just stop me or raise your hand or, or frown. And uh, if enough of you do that, I'll figure it out, I think. OK. So Pleasant Ridge really begins uh, with the Virgil Rose Farm, uh, which was located at the intersection of what is now uh, Woodward and Ten Mile, uh, back in the early 1800s. And of course, there was no intersection then, uh, and the farm was bounded on the west by what was known as the Saginaw Trail. Saginaw Trail was the first major path into the heartland of Michigan, and it ran from Detroit into what was then the hinterlands, following an old Indian trail, uh, which rose up from the Detroit River and eventually led to Pontiac. Today, that Saginaw Trail is Ridge Road. In the late 1840s, Virgil Rose uh, opened a tavern at the major intersection where Woodward and Maine and Ten Mile now meet. And this tavern became an important stop along what was becoming a new plank road that was being built from Detroit to Pontiac. Now, plank roads were pretty common back in those days. They were essentially roads with wooden planks laid over them to try to make traveling uh, more reliable and, and easier. Back in the old days when people rode horses and rode in wagons, and any amount of rain could turn the road into a quagmire that was virtually impassable. So this was a very important road. And Virgil Rose's Tavern was perfectly situated because it was about a day's ride out from Detroit if you were heading north. So it was a natural stopping point uh, for anyone who was journeying into the heart of Michigan. Uh, the Rose Tavern was very popular and uh, continued to be so until it was destroyed by a fire in 1880. The real development of, <laughs> excuse me, the real development of the area didn't begin until a little bit later, though. In fact, quite later, the early 1900s, when an attorney named Alfred Wilcox created the first plat for the area. That is, he divided up the property into saleable lots. Uh, Wilcox had actually been living in the area for about 15 years on the old Virgil Rose property. And he's the one that created what was called the Oakland Place Subdivision, which is along the west side of Ridge Road, south of Ten Mile. Next slide, please. That's the one I was looking for. Uh, he planted out the Oakland Place Subdivision with about 12 residential sites of about five acres apiece. And you can still see the outlines of these original properties in the streets, uh, Woodside Park, uh, Ken Burton, Elm Park, Norwich, Hanover, Cambridge, they bound, or the boundaries are, of those original lot lines. 
The first home, which I just showed you a second ago, was built in 1908, and it still stands at 44 Ridge Road. It was originally the Clarence Clark House, but it was awfully lonely for a while, and it wasn't uh, until quite, well, a few years later that it began to gain some neighbors. The west side of Ridge Road was the original settlement. It was the first area to become populated. Uh, there were about 10 houses built over a period of eight years. I was playing with my PowerPoint today, so we'll see what, what comes of this. The second plat in the city was the Woodward Park subdivision, uh, which was laid out in 1908 on either side of what is now Maplefield Road. There it is. Then in 1910, Alfred Wilcox platted two more subdivisions, which covered essentially from 10 miles south to Oakland Park and from Woodward West to Ridge Road, which is the area in there. Meanwhile, population was growing. People were buying these lots and beginning to construct houses. And in 1919, Pleasant Ridge was incorporated as a village. The platting of the area continued on, particularly on the east side of Woodward, uh, through the late 1930s, in which time the form of the city was essentially set. Then enters a man named Walter Gerke. Now, is that, does anybody know the proper pronunciation of his name? Is it Gerke? Gerke is correct. Gerke, okay. Walter Gerke was the most active developer in the area. Uh, he developed Poplar Park, Elm Park, Oakland Park. Uh, he went on to found the first federal savings and loan in Detroit, which was important because it was the largest home mortgage holder in Michigan at one time. And essentially what happened was that the home, potential homeowners would buy the land that was platted out by Wilcox, and then they would uh, hire someone to design and construct a house for them. And as we'll see, that resulted in a nice assortment of different styles in Pleasant Ridge, it is not a community where you have a re repetition of one style over and over again, or I'm sure you're all familiar with this. You've seen uh, even older towns and villages where the entire street will basically be the same design with a little bit of a change. Uh, luckily, Pleasant Ridge started off different from that and continued on. In the early 1920s, water lines, sewer lines, street lights, and garbage collection became, uh, began and Pleasant Ridge started to settle in as a nice suburb. But while all this was going on, something very, very important was happening just a few miles away from here. All of the communities in Oakland County were affected by Henry Ford's decision to open a new automobile factory in Highland Park in 1909. It was located just three miles north of the Detroit city limits at the time, but it proved to be a major, major event. Uh, up until this time, workers had traditionally lived near the place where they worked, and this was no different in the auto industry. So the factories were in Detroit, and the workers lived in Detroit. But Ford, for various reasons, decided to move out of the city limits and start anew and build a new factory. And of course, what happened was, when the work moved, the workers moved with it. And this would begin a dramatic population shift in Detroit of people moving to what would become the northern suburbs. It led to the development of all sorts of towns and villages in the area. And here's a chart that just gives you kind of a, a rough look at uh, when these things were sort of officially designated villages and when they became incorporated as a city, Pleasant Ridge, it was a village in 1919, became a city in 1928, uh, except for Royal Oak, that's pretty much in line with the other neighboring communities. <clears throat> One of the reasons why Pleasant Ridge and uh, other places became a city was that they were worried. Uh, along with this growth of worker, or the movement of workers to the north, and the filling out of these suburbs to the north, Detroit itself began to expand. And it basically tripled in size. The square footage or the square mileage of the city of Detroit tripled between 1910 and 1930. It was seen as a sort of behemoth that was going to swallow up all these other communities if they didn't do something. And so Pleasant Ridge, like other places, became a city just so that it would help them fight off any annexation attempts by Detroit. Next slide. 
So Pleasant Ridge grows along with other places like Royal Oak and Huntington Woods, and uh, what helps to spur some of that growth, in addition to more population, just sort of generally locating north of Detroit, are changes in transportation. And in fact, it, what happened was that it became easier for people who lived in these areas to be able to get to work in Detroit, which is where most of the people who lived around here uh, were employed. So, for instance, you have the development of rail lines, uh, beginning with the Detroit Pontiac Railway, which reached out to Pleasant Ridge by 1895 and went all the way out from Detroit to Pontiac by 1897. Uh, this is the real introduction of commuter travel in the region. The interurban, the Detroit interurban, uh, was uh, completed from Detroit all the way out to Birmingham by, by 1896. The Detroit United Railway operated from 1900 to 1922, and it had stops in the area. Particularly, there were express and local stops at Woodward and Ten Mile, and there were local stops at Oakland Park and Poplar Park. So all this made it easier for people to travel around, but particularly to get downtown and back. Uh, it, the trip on a train usually took about an hour from here, and it cost about 10 cents, which was very reasonable. And so it laid the foundation for uh, the numerous professionals who began to settle in this area and gave them an opportunity to work in downtown, but to live out here, you know, where it's a little more pleasant. And then, of course, there's the story of the automobile, which I don't really need to get into too much, but just to know that, uh, uh, you know, in the early days when Pleasant Ridge was forming, uh, automobile travel was still rather an adventure. Uh, this is a nice photograph that I like from mid-1920s, where there's a major traffic jam on Woodward, and, you know, <laughs> major may be understating it, but... Uh, uh, I would like to get a good photograph of muddy roads back then, too, because that was an issue. Uh, along with, you know, back in the horse and carriage days, the plank roads were a solution, or a proposed solution to travel problems. Well, by the time you got to the 1910s, 1920s, you had all these automobiles suddenly going up and down roads like Woodward, and it was realized that they needed to start paving or doing something because uh, it was becoming a major problem. So Woodward was really one of the first major paved roads in the world. Uh, you may not know this, but there was a stretch between six mile and seven mile, which was the first paved automobile road in the world. And then uh, shortly thereafter, uh, that was in 1909, shortly thereafter it was, the paving was extended up to eight mile. Uh, then after that, Royal Oak paid to have it paved from eight mile to 12 mile. And eventually by 1916, which is really pretty early, there, Woodward was paved from Detroit all the way to Pontiac. And so as automobile ownership increases exponentially, and just to throw out a statistic because I, I like statistics, uh, in 1913, the Highland Park Ford plant was producing 800 Model Ts every day. So that gives you a sense of the demand that was out there for these automobiles. So Woodward's a major artery. Uh, you can theoretically get downtown in a decent amount of time, whether you take the train or whether you drive a car. And it, it sets up Pleasant Ridge as a kind of classic early 20th century suburb. It has a nice semi-rural location. It has reliable transportation to a downtown area with lots of employment. And it has motivated developers. <clears throat> And as you can see here, the population also sort of takes off during this time period. I'm, I'm afraid I stretched this out a little bit too far. Uh, I borrowed this graph from someone, and I should have cut it off around 1950 or so. But the key is that the population explosion occurs here between roughly 1910 and 1940. And that's a very steep increase in the number of people who live here. And not coincidentally, that is the time period when most of the houses in Pleasant Ridge were constructed. That leads me into part two of my talk, which is uh, a brief history of the architectural styles pleasant, present in Pleasant Ridge. That's twice. <laughs> the architectural styles present in Pleasant Ridge and uh, what their background is and, and what they're trying to do and, and where they came from. Next, please. 
So here's another nice graphic, which I was able to glean from the survey information uh, prepared for the National Register Historic District uh, nomination, which shows the number of homes built in the Central Historic District by decade. And as you can see here also, the 1920s is the boom, but the 1910s and 1930s were also very significant in terms of home construction here. Next, please. Now, there's also an interesting trend in terms of the styles, the styles of homes that were built during these time periods. As you can see, it changes. In the 1910s, and these are categories that uh, are used in these nomination forms, they're recognized by the National Park Service. And, uh, we could get into a debate about stylistic terminology that could last for hours, but we'll just go with these. Uh, if you look at it, you can see, hopefully, 1910s, What's called arts and crafts is the number one style of house, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a few minutes, uh, by far. By the 1920s, though, there are hardly any of these night arts, and, arts and crafts buildings being constructed, and instead, Tudor revival, colonial revival, and what's called English cottage revival, which is essentially the same as Tudor, as I'll show you in a second, uh, they really take off. By the 1930s, that Tudor boom is pretty much over, and it's colonial revival that dominates the decades after that, the 30s and 40s. So I think it's really interesting to see these trends because they're a good uh, indicator of what the national tastes were in housing styles as well. So I want to go through these uh, styles one by one very quickly and just give you a sense of uh, what they're all about in case you don't know. And, and a little bit of where they came from and what they were supposed to mean to uh, individuals. Starting with the early days, in the 1900s to 1910s, uh, as I said, the first home in Pleasant Ridge was constructed in 1908, and then in the 1910s there was the beginnings of uh, a kind of construction boom that goes on. And in those early years, as you can see by this photograph from Ridge Road, uh, a lot of the houses were generally related to what's called the American Foursquare, the traditional American vernacular house. And here's a good one, not from Pleasant Ridge, but it's a good representation of this, this real common American house that you find all across the country, but particularly east of the, the Mississippi. And as I said, it's a, a vernacular kind of house. It has its roots in sort of everyday a building not designed so much by architects uh, like the styles that we're going to look at in a few minutes. Now, don't get me wrong, by the time we get to the 1900s and 1910s, these are designed by architects, but they're supposed to reflect a kind of simpler tradition, almost a, a going back to America's agrarian roots, like these are modified farmhouses a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the four squares have uh, characteristic features. First of all, they tend to be very cubic or rectangular, but mostly cubic. You know, it's nice boxy form. If you look at a floor plan, they tend to be uh, nicely square and full of little square rooms inside. So they're boxes within boxes within boxes. Uh, the center, the door to the building tends to be in the center, right in the middle. It's balanced on either side by uh, equal number of windows. So there's a nice symmetry to the appearance. And the pyramid roof is very, very common in these four square houses. Beyond that, there's not a lot of stylistic characteristics. They're described oftentimes as being plain, but they were intentionally so. Uh, one of the selling points of these types of houses in the early 20th century was that they were a good American house, that they didn't have their roots in some foreign country like a Gothic revival or a Tudor revival, and that you could sort of express your patriotism by having a good American-derived four-square house. Next one. So there are numerous examples, and, and this is where it's going to get tough because uh, the images get smaller and the, the words get smaller, but we'll do the best we can. Uh, there are variations of this four-square all throughout. Uh, Pleasant Ridge, and as you can see, you know, they're mostly built in the 1910s, and they don't all follow the same characteristics. 
Some have the pyramid roof, some have uh, an, a different type of roof, some have an elaborated front door and others don't. But in general, if you know the characteristics of the four square, you can kind of recognize them all throughout the community. In the 1910s, though, according to that uh, chart that I showed you and the statistics that were uh, gathered about 15, 20 years ago, the main surge in home construction in Pleasant Ridge came in what's known as arts and crafts type houses. Uh, now, as I said, that's a very nebulous kind of term. It's a blanket term, uh, often used like bungalow and craftsman, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, The kind of talk about a generic type of house that it's like you know it when you see it, but you can't quite put your fingers on exactly what the characteristics are. Arts and crafts relates to a movement that developed in England in the mid-1800s, and originally this movement was a reaction against industrialization. And the proponents of the arts and crafts in its original form uh, were very concerned about what they saw as the deterioration of Western society, uh, the dehumanization of people, what, when, which occurs when machines take over their jobs more and more, uh, the separation of workers from the end product, the increase in large factories and poor working conditions, the beginnings of pollution, uh, all these things uh, outraged some people, particularly in England, and they started what's known as the Arts and Crafts Movement, which was dedicated towards uh, creating a more human environment for ourselves through the objects that we make and through the houses and the buildings that we create. So characteristics of Arts and Crafts are things like uh, emphasizing handmade or hand-carved or hand-cut objects, uh, instead of machine-made, sort of repetitiously identical parts, uh, emphasizing natural materials, emphasizing simplicity, and uh, it was really a, a lifestyle choice. A lot of these people were socialists and were trying to uh, get rid of the capitalist system uh, at the time, and uh, it was more than just a, an aesthetic preference. Now, when this comes to the United States, which it does in the late 1890s, I think the first Arts and Crafts Society in the U.S. was in 1897. Uh, it loses a lot of this uh, ideological foundation. You know, in America, we're not against machines and machine production at, at any time. Even back in the early or the late 1800s, we were all in favor of factories and machines and all that stuff. We're a good nation of progress. So it sort of loses the background and it becomes an aesthetic choice. And arts and crafts becomes an image. Uh, it becomes an aesthetic for furniture, for house design, for graphic design, for a number of different things. And as I mentioned, it, it emphasizes natural materials left in their natural state. It emphasizes simplicity and cleanness. Uh, I have an image uh, coming up in a few minutes where there's a good contrast between a kind of arts and crafts interior and a traditional Victorian interior. But the arts and crafts can be further broken down if you want to get into this sort of uh, parsing in terms of uh, characteristics like bungalows and craftsman houses and prairie style houses and, and whatnot, but they really are all coming from the same place. So technically, for instance, if I was forced to make some determinations on the styles of these particular houses, I would say that, of course, they're all arts and crafts. I mean, that's the easy way out. But uh, you could also go a little bit further and say that the two top houses are probably best characterized as bungalows. Uh, again, that's subject to debate, but bungalow really is a, a phrase that relates to a particular type of house that demonstrates characteristics like a big, big, big roof that generally takes up the entire house and the front porch. So big roof, front porch extending across the facade, all under one roof. Uh, that was intentional because it uh, unified the entire building into one. And uh, the, the promoters of this type of style would say that this sort of provides an image of security and stability for the occupants. It symbolizes shelter. Uh, if you're familiar with Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture from his early days, the Prairie School days, that's exactly what he was doing. Uh, 
with his major overhanging large roofs that kind of shelter the rest of the house and he himself talked about his architectural design his domestic design as an image of shelter a safe place to be so big low wide low pitched roofs often looking like it's a one story house even though rarely is but because the second story is tucked up underneath this giant roof it appears to be one story and that also adds to the unity the overall unity the front porch as I mentioned which usually extends the entire length of the facade uh, was promoted as a way to enjoy nature and bring nature into your house so you could sit outside and catch a nice breeze and breathe fresh air uh, and you know get out of your stifling interior and natural materials are also emphasized in these bungalows uh, wood stone brick left in their natural state as much as possible the term bungalow itself you may know this comes from India and it relates to a kind of uh, traditional type of house that the English encountered as they occupied and colonized India that went through all sorts of uh, uh, adjustments before it came to the United States in the late 1800s, uh, particularly on the West Coast, and settled in as a nice kind of affordable, natural, simple type of housing. Bungalows and craftsman houses, which I will talk about in a second, were also promoted as being particularly American, strangely enough. Even though their roots were in somewhere else in the world, uh, again, developers and architects could point to buildings like these and say, you know, these are not based on anything that you can find in Europe. These are not European tradition. These are unique to the United States and they symbolize our individuality and our difference from Europeans and so we should embrace it as our kind of natural style or natural heritage. Oh wait, uh, before I get to that, and so the one on the right uh, I didn't mean to ignore but that's probably best described as a craftsman house. Uh, the term craftsman really is associated with Gustav Stickley who you may be familiar with, uh, who is a furniture designer first and foremost but also got into the business of designing houses and writing about lifestyles and uh, essentially talked about a lot of the things that I've already talked about, how you should have your house be natural materials and have a sort of representative American image that's not traced back to European roots and all that. And he put out the Craftsman magazine, which is where the, the name comes from, uh, illustrating a number of houses that look quite a bit like this. And if you want to nitpick is the difference between a bungalow and a craftsman house well uh, I think the most common difference that's cited is that the craftsman house has these brackets underneath the roof line and I know it's tough to see but go home and look at your front porch and if you see brackets up there that are really visible could be a craftsman house and the other thing is that the supports that hold up that roof uh, tend to be square and tapered and I think you can kind of see that in that small picture, but you know, really it is nitpicking. There, the differences between bungalow and craftsman house are uh, a lot of historians feel that there are none whatsoever. It's just terminology. But these are the kind of houses that dominated design in Pleasant Ridge in the 1910s. As we move into the 1920s, oh, before I forget, one other thing that may help you to indicate whether you have an arts and crafts bungalow or craftsman house or not uh, has to do with the, the plan, the floor plan. Another aspect of these arts and crafts style houses that was promoted was their informality and that's something that I'll talk about more in a few minutes but in terms of the layout of the rooms uh, there was a, a revolution that was beginning in terms of how spaces were arranged inside of your house and, and what those spaces meant. And essentially, you began to get into a situation in the early 20th century where you had formal designs and informal designs. And as a rule of thumb, if you walk in your front door and you look straight ahead and there's a stairway leading up, that's a formal design. If you walk your, into your front door and you're in the living room and not a hallway, that's an informal design. And both of them have roots that go way back uh, into history. But the craftsman bungalow, the craftsman houses, the bungalow houses, the prairie style houses, etc. Uh, oftentimes you would sort of just walk right into a living room instead of this vestibule and then a big hall 
and it was seen as a more informal design, which was also promoted as being particularly American at the time, strangely enough, that uh, I don't know if they felt that, you know, we have worse manners than the Europeans, or, you know, I think it has more to do with democracy. Okay. So back to our uh, chart. We've been through the 1910s, but now in the 1920s and 30s, something else happens, and those arts and crafts houses begin to disappear in Pleasant Ridge, and what you get is a whole onslaught of historically styled houses. Here's a view of Oakland Park in 1925, where you can see the beginnings of that. If you can recall that uh, shot of Ridge Road that I showed before, where it was a series of four squares, essentially, well, now you're starting to get other historical styles coming in. And the, the most popular one in the 1920s is called Tudor Revival, which you may be familiar with uh, from such land, local landmarks as the Edsel Ford House or Meadowbrook Hall. It was very, very popular at all socioeconomic levels during the 1920s, uh, from sort of lower middle class up through the wealthy mansions like those, but particularly for the wealthy. They sort of latched on to this Tudor revival as a, uh, an appropriate image. And it comes from England. It comes from uh, basically Tudor England, which was 16th century England, where, actually, let's go one more. Yeah. This is a traditional uh, English house, or a couple of houses from that time period. And you can see the characteristics there that uh, back then were not stylistic affectations, that's just how they built. So characteristics of the Tudor revival that you see in the 20th century in American houses, in places like Pleasant Ridge, include this verticality. There's often these steeply pitched roofs. And, uh, many times there are gabled roofs perpendicular to each other, as, as we'll see here in a minute. Uh, there are vertical lines that sort of run from the ground up to the roof line. Many times there's a, a visible wooden frame. This is called half timbering. And it was, back in these days, it was a construction technique where you set up a wooden frame, skeleton, to make the house, and then you filled in between those wooden posts with whatever material you could find. Oftentimes it was mud or uh, clay mixed in with straw and horse hair and other things as a binder, you'd fill that in and it would dry and hopefully it would be a nice solid wall to keep the elements out. But it left the wooden frame visible. And so when you see an original Tudor building like this, that wood is actually part of the framework. But when you, go back one please. Back one, yeah. When you see the uh, variations that you get in the United States in the 20th century, you often find half timbering that is completely applied as a decorative element. So sharply pitched, steep roofs, uh, oftentimes brick or stucco facade with this half timbering incorporated in, but of course it's not structural anymore by this time, it's all for show. Uh, tall, narrow windows, tall, thin windows, add to this verticality that is prominent and part of the uh, uh, aesthetic. Very tall chimneys, oftentimes narrow chimneys, oftentimes multiple chimneys. Uh, basically, whenever you see the big pointed upside down V, that's a Tudor revival. And as I'm sure you're aware, they're all throughout Pleasant Ridge. Now, there's also a surge in construction of what the uh, National Park Service called the Cottage Revival, or the English Cottage Style. And I've given a couple examples here on the right. Essentially what the, is called the English Cottage Style is a sort of toned down version of Tudor. It's really the same thing, but the houses tend to be a little bit smaller. Uh, the, the spikiness or the verticality tends to be a little bit less. There tends to be a little more stucco and a little less brick. Uh, oftentimes a little bit less half timbering, but essentially it's the same sort of thing. And it really, again, comes from England. Uh, the Cottage Revival in particular is used to describe a type of house that's based on uh, historical examples from the Cotswold region in England. So Tudor Revival, English Cottage Revival, whatever you want to call it, they have English precedents reaching back for centuries, 
But in the United States in the 1920s, they become, so, and tens and 20s and 30s really, they become associated with uh, sort of prestige that, uh, you know, it's okay for a, a certain income level to have maybe a four square in 1905, but by 1925, people who are in the same socioeconomic stratus don't find that appropriate anymore. Now tastes have changed and something like a Tudor revival is seen as being more appropriate to their position. Plus it's a little more exotic too, I think, and there's a, um, a kind of taste for exoticism that runs through American architecture during this time period. And then when we get into the 1930s and 40s, colonial revival becomes the dominant style in Pleasant Ridge and around America. Uh, by far, if I would bring back my chart, you would see that the colonial revival dominates home construction in Pleasant Ridge in the 1930s and 40s. And this is uh, in keeping with trends across the country. Uh, it gets to the point where Numerous observers of the architectural scene in the 1930s say that essentially colonial revival is the American style. It is our heritage. You know, those people who'd been talking about bungalows or four squares and all that, they're, they're wrong. There's no history that links Americans to those types of styles. But here you have a colonial past. You can see the colonial past all over the east coast of America, and that is our true architectural heritage. And so this sort of thing um, sprouts up all across the country. And in terms of characteristics, you know, there, there are variations of colonial revival, and again, I think it's a, an example of, we generally know it when we see it, uh, but it's tough to kind of list exactly what it means. In most cases, it has to do with a building that is balanced and symmetrical. You know, there's a front door and it's right in the middle of the facade. And the windows on either side of the facade are equal size and equal distance. So there's a nice symmetrical relationship. The front door tends to be emphasized. We go one more, please. Oh, one more. Front doors tend to be emphasized in some way, oftentimes with a triangular pediment over them or a, a rounded arch. Uh, flanked by columns or attached columns or flattened columns up against the wall, but many times there's some sort of emphasis on the front door. Uh, roofs come in all kinds of variations. Sometimes you have pyramid roofs, sometimes you have gabled roofs. Um, it's hard to say, you know, that there's one particular roof style for colonial revival. It has more to do with the overall image and the overall interest in balance and symmetry and, and proportion. Go back one, please. Now, I like to show this uh, cartoon from The New Yorker from 1946 because it's a good summary of what was going on in terms of domestic architecture at the time. And I'm sure you can't read the dates, but it's called the Remodeled House. And here's the house originally built in 1790, and it's a colonial house. In 1840, it gets remodeled into kind of a super colonial house. They add a few things to it, extended uh, a little bit. 1870, it becomes a full-blown Victorian. Yeah, they put a tower on it and some doodads and hee-haws and all kinds of decoration on the outside. 1910, it gets turned into what's called a shingle-style house, which was a popular house on the East Coast, um, which was a, an attempt to reflect American colonial heritage, and it was really characterized by the addition of shingles to houses. And then in 1946, it comes back to what it was in 1790, and that's because the trend the fad in the 1930s and 40s is colonial revival. So it had to go through all those adjustments and remodelings to get back to what it once was. And I think that's a good commentary on American domestic tastes uh, from around that period. One more. Now, I said colonial revival is promoted as this kind of uh, American thing, the, the unique American style, more so than bungalows or four squares or that sort of thing. Well, a couple of the reasons for this have to do with larger issues that are going on in society. And I'll just, it's a very complex kind of uh, uh, story, but I'll just touch on a few things that I think influence this real fascination with colonial revival in the 30s in particular. Uh, part of it has to do with colonial Williamsburg. I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but it's really quite a place. 
Um, and by that I mean it's, it's quite a reconstruction. Uh, what happened was that in the 1920s, in the late 1920s, the Rockefeller family decided to recreate colonial Williamsburg, which had been the capital of, of Virginia when it was a colony before the, the Revolutionary War. Unfortunately, something like 90% of all the structures that ever existed in colonial Williamsburg were, were gone at this point. So the government, and this is in the Depression, or it starts in the late 20s and then continues through the Depression. The government hires teams of architects and archaeologists and historians to research Colonial Williamsburg and then to uh, create a plan for re remaking it. It's almost like uh, a Disney type of situation. And you know, if you've been to Epcot Center, uh, that's one of the closest examples that I can give. But this is full scale recreation. And I show you this uh, picture because it shows you the, the kind of highlight of Colonial Williamsburg, which is the governor's palace. At the time they began working on this project, all that existed of the governor's palace were the foundations, which they had to dig down to find, uh, a very sketchy drawing, and some descriptions, written descriptions. And that was it. Out of that, they created this which is really a 1930s building. But it is 1930s architects attempting to imagine what the 16, I think this dates back to about 1620 originally, uh, what that might have been like. So it's totally recreated, as is much of the rest of Colonial Williamsburg. But this captured the American imagination. It was heavily publicized uh, throughout popular journals, and magazines, uh, newsreels. You know, the Rockefellers remake, or they didn't say remake back then, they said like rehabilitate or uh, resurrect Colonial Williamsburg. So it became very popular and it became on the consciousness of Americans. And along with this, there's a great increase in interest in colonial furniture. And you have all kinds of uh, Williamsburg lines of furniture coming out and they replicate this very simplistic type of uh, furniture that existed in the colonial days. So that goes into, you know, kind of drumming up support for a colonial revival during this time period. Uh, something else that enters into it is the end of World War I, where the United States intervenes and becomes a world power, essentially, for the first time. They're a player on the, mid, on the world stage. Uh, and so there's a kind of national pride surrounding that that really didn't exist before World War I. We've, we've sort of stepped up into world politics and, and world events, and we've come out successfully. And so there's a real patriotism that's going around in the 1920s and 1930s that feeds into this desire for colonial revival architecture. And hand in hand with that, there are increases in immigration. Um, and in fact, in particular, a changing nature of immigrants that happens as you get farther into the 20th century, where you get more and more people coming from southern and eastern Europe. And this, uh, this becomes a problem for some families who've been here for a while. They see it as a threat. Um, it, interestingly, if you go back and read some of the literature uh, regarding this from this time period, it, it, it resonates today with the, the debate around the immigration and the border problem in the American Southwest. But back then you had people who were worried that we were letting in too many folks who were not Anglo-Saxon or in other words, they were Italian and they were Hungarian and Czechoslovakian and Irish uh, in particular came in for a lot of uh, resentment at the time. And so some folks saw this as a kind of attack on, on America that we're getting, letting in two non-American types, whatever that means. So they sort of, you know, solidified around America and, and promoted patriotism and American characteristics as a way to fight back against this onslaught of people who were different. That's a negative influence, but nonetheless it is an influence that sort of continues to put issues of patriotism and nationality into the forefront during the 1920s and 30s, which feeds into the interest in colonial revival architecture. Okay, to get off those heavy topics and move on to architecture for a minute, the English colonial revival is what I've been showing you. But that wasn't the only colonial revival going around in the 20s and 30s. And you can see that reflected in Pleasant Ridge. So you have a couple of examples of Dutch colonial architecture. Well, what makes this Dutch? Uh, 
the roof, essentially. The Dutch colonial is characterized by a particular type of roof. It's called a gambrel roof, and it's a roof that has two different pitches. So it'll go up at one angle, and then it'll curve and pitch at a different angle. So it's sort of a, a double sloped roof. Uh, you can kind of see here, this one's better, but I, I took a picture at the wrong time. There's a French revival, or a French colonial revival, which is characterized by steep, steep, steeply pitched roofs, and oftentimes very tall and uh, prominent chimneys. Uh, this is something that, oddly enough, doesn't really go back to France at all, but it relates to colonial buildings that were built by French people in North America, uh, particularly the really, really large, steeply pitched roof. And there's even a, an example of Spanish colonial. Uh, although this is, you know, not exactly a hacienda, it would be considered Spanish colonial because of the twisting columns and the arches, and the, uh, some of these have tile roofs, and it's, it's really... Spanish colonial is sort of the least... Uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. It, there aren't that many examples throughout the country other than in the Southwest, and, and those examples that are called Spanish colonial are really kind of questionable. But I show you this just, just to show you that there are varieties of colonial revival that are going on in the, in the 20s and 30s. Okay. Now, part three. Now that I've been through a history of Pleasant Ridge and a quick survey of the different styles that are going on, during this time period, I want to finish up by focusing on a little bit of background as to what was changing these houses in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s in particular. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that there's a revolution in domestic architecture that's going on, and it really begins around uh, 1880 or so. It's hard to put a finger on it, but lasts up through the 1930s. And it's a revolution not just in the way buildings and houses look from the street, but what happens inside them. And that's what I want to focus on for the last few minutes. Because it's an interesting fact that even though you have such stylistic variety in the houses of Pleasant Ridge and so many different uh, appearing buildings up and down the streets that look so different on the outside, on the inside there are a lot of similarities. And this comes from the fact that these were all built roughly the same time period, roughly in the same couple of decades. And so they're all influenced by the same factors that are influencing houses uh, across the country, whatever particular style they happen to be in. And as I mentioned in the beginning, this really is the revolution in American domestic architecture. It probably more changes occur quicker between 1880 and 1930 than at any other time in American history. So I want to look at a few of these changes and, and how they relate to uh, the architecture. First, let's remind ourselves of what preceded these kinds of houses that we've been looking at and that I'll be talking about. Uh, I got this out of a book. This was a uh, proposed design dating from 1886, and it was called the Michigan House. And it's a good representative of the, what I'm going to call the Victorian House of the mid to late 1800s. Uh, those houses did not feature the same kind of historical styles that we've just been through. And inside, they were much different than the kinds of houses that are built in Pleasant Ridge. So there are a number of social changes that impact architecture and architectural design in uh, houses during this time period. One of the first important ones is there's a growing informality in social relations. Uh, you can go back and look at magazines and books and uh, newspapers and all sorts of historical evidence that talks about how life is becoming less formal in this time period than it had been before. How the younger people are living a less formal life than their predecessors, their parents, their grandparents. And things are getting more relaxed and casual. And this extends to manners, it extends to fashion, it extends to entertainment, and it extends to architecture. So, I'm going to go through these uh, sort of as a list first, and then we'll look at the particular applications in architecture. Next, please. There are also fewer domestic servants. Uh, a sharp decrease in the number of domestic servants after 1900. 
Uh, again, some statistics, which I particularly like. In 1900, it was estimated that for every 1,000 American families, 80 of them had live-in domestic servants. By 1920, it was estimated that only 39 out of every 1,000 families had live-ins. So it was cut in half in 20 years and would continue to drop after that. Uh, families of the same socioeconomic level who would have had maybe <coughs> one or two live-ins in 1880, 1920 would have maybe one person that would come in but not live in or wouldn't have any help at all. So there's a major change in the internal workings of the houses in the sense that hired servants, hired staff are disappearing. Thanks. There's a decrease in birth rates, a significant decrease in birth rates from uh, around 1880 through 1930, which would result in smaller families, which would result in smaller houses. And I'll show you a graphic on that in a minute. There's the rise of the efficiency movement, which is something that really encompasses all aspects of American life. It, it begins in business. It's, these are time management studies and efficiency experts, people who would go into businesses and study how people worked and then give suggestions on how they might work quicker and more efficiently and produce more. Well, this spreads out to American culture in general. And there are all kinds of articles uh, from this early time period talking about how you can run your household more efficiently and how you can design your kitchen more efficiently and how you can live your life more efficiently. There's an increase in household technology in the sense that this is the time when indoor plumbing starts to come in and not just bathrooms but just running water has a huge effect on the, the design of houses. But also mechanical heating systems start to become widespread. And kitchen technology uh, starts to increase during this time period as well. And finally, there's a communications revolution, or the telephone, which uh, really changes social behaviors uh, in a way that a lot of people don't think about. And uh, my statistic for this is that by 1903, there was an estimated 2 million telephones in the United States already. Uh, there were some towns that had almost complete telephone service by the 1890s. It really spread very, very rapidly once that technology was introduced. So there are other factors as well, but I'm going to focus on these and, and how they changed houses and how they would affect the design of the kinds of houses that were created here in Pleasant Ridge. So the effects are, first of all, houses get smaller. This is a nice graphic that uh, is based on information which shows that between 1880 the 1880s and the 1940s, the average size of the American house shrunk significantly from roughly 2,500 square feet to less than 1,000. Uh, and it was a continuous decline. So this is tied into the efficiency movement, uh, all these messages coming at people about how to run a more efficient household, a healthier household, how it's easier to clean a smaller house, uh, that sort of thing. It also has to do with declining birth rates. And um, it also has to do with the increase in things like indoor plumbing and heating. Because if you think about it, a person who has X number of dollars to buy a house, uh, in 1880, they spend all that money really just on the envelope of the house. There is no indoor plumbing. There is no heating system. All your money goes towards buying house so you can get a certain amount of square footage. Well, in 1920, that X number of dollars has to go into the envelope of the house, but also these systems now, the plumbing system, the heating system, which are expensive. And you don't get as much for your money as you used to, meaning that this envelope or the size of your house is going to be smaller if you're spending really the same amount. Very important development is the replacement of the parlor and the sitting room with the living room. Now, the parlor was the heart of the Victorian house. It was absolutely the most important room in any 19th century house. Parlors were more than just rooms to hold your stuff. They were a statement to the world. Now, this is a, a, a society that was very, very formal. As I mentioned, this is where the informality starts to come in. 
Uh, they were formal in terms of their manners, in terms of the way they interacted, even with friends and family. And the parlor was sort of the epitome of that. The parlor was the room where you kept your best things, your special things, the family Bible, your paintings, your statues, your books, if you didn't have a library. Uh, and it had special furniture that was not designed for heavy usage. It wasn't designed for everyday use. You generally only used the parlor when people came over or when there was an occasion that involved bringing people into your house who were not members of your family. So uh, guests were entertained in the parlor. Weddings occurred in parlors. Funerals occurred in parlors. All sorts of public type activities. And so the parlor was the presentation area of your house. Uh, as one historian said, they were designed for culture and not comfort. It was where you showed off how refined you are and what your good taste was in art and furniture, and, uh, etc. But that begins to change once you get into the 20th century. And the parlor begins to disappear in favor of the living room. And it, it's a big change, not just in terminology, but in usage. The living room is a multi-purpose room. It's as much for the family as it is for outsiders. And in fact, it's probably more for the family. And in this sense, comfort begins to take over for culture. The living room is not a really room for presenting your image of yourself to outsiders. It's a room for using. And so there's this big switch from living room to parlor. Uh, even in terminology, there are, uh, for instance, the Grand Rapids Furniture Record, which is a, an important periodical of furniture, by 1920 doesn't use the word parlor anymore. Other periodicals just remove that word from the vocabulary. Uh, builder's guides with floor plans remove the parlor in favor of the living room. And as I said, it's more than just terminology, it's a lifestyle change. That room is for comfort, it's for the family, it's for entertaining outsiders, but it's for us to use as well. And along with that, there's a, a decrease in the number of single purpose rooms. So typical house in the 1870s, 80s uh, of a certain uh, income status might have a library or a music room or a conservatory or a sitting room. Uh, these things disappear in the early 20th century. So most of you, I would be willing to guess, don't have sitting rooms, libraries, music rooms in your house, but I'm sure you all have living rooms. Now, some of them may have been originally considered parlors, uh, but most likely not. So this ties into the informality that's developing in uh, uh, American society as relationships get less and less formal. And also related to that is the shrinking or the elimination of the front hall which is the hall that runs through the middle of your house, contains the stairway to get up to the upper floors. But more important, in the Victorian house, the front hall was the staging area for all sorts of social relationships. Uh, in particular, it was the place where you began the process of formal calling. Now, you may know something about this. It's a really odd 19th century tradition that's long since passed. But Back in those days, uh, you didn't just you know, decide to go walk over to your neighbor's house uninvited and say, hi, how's it going? It was a very formal process that involved you know, knocking on the door, and the servant would open the door, and, and you would make a formal calling on the people that lived there, usually the lady of the house. And you would enter into the front hall and wait while the uh, servant would go contact the woman and see if she would receive you. And there was a good chance that she wouldn't. Uh, oftentimes, if you were busy or just wanted to be left alone, you would send the message to your servant that uh, you're not available or you're not at home. You may have heard that phrase. And so you would know that you know, the person just isn't going to see you now. Or it was used also as a way to kind of uh, expand your social connections. You could go to someone's house that you don't know and present yourself, which involved also a card. Uh, people used to have personal cards back then, like we have business cards. And, and if you went to a stranger's house, you would present your card to the servant who would carry it on a tray to the lady of the house. And if the card came back to you, that meant she was not going to see you. But if she accepted your card, then you could have an audience with her. And then you would go into the parlor and have tea and have a very kind of 
formal discussion. And this even uh, took place among friends. I mean, it was more, less informal than that, but still, there was kind of a ritual that went along with this. And the hall was the key to all this. The hall was the staging area where someone who didn't live in your house could be in your house, but not in the most private parts. The hall was also a place where your servants could move around through your house without going into individual rooms and thereby sort of intruding a little further on your privacy. So the hall is a, a key element of the Victorian uh, society and the, the manners, the formal manners that are uh, prevalent then. And as you get into the 20th century, that starts to break down. It begins to disappear, in fact. Uh, the whole idea of formal calling disappears. And uh, part of this has to do with just a general informality that goes on between people. Uh, sociologists have found that household entertainment changes during this, these decades. People end up uh, going out more, as a matter of fact. With the invention of motion pictures and the automobile, there seems to be this drive to go out of your house for entertainment more so than in the past. In the past, you invited people in for entertainment. And even when you do, those entertainments change. People relate to each other more informally and uh, less sort of stiff and, and mannered. And the telephone enters into this as well. Because, you know, now suddenly, you, if you have a close friend that you have a, want to have a brief conversation with, instead of going over to their house and going through the ritual, you can just pick up the telephone and talk to them for a few minutes. So it eliminates a lot of the uh, contact of, uh, between people who know each other, of having to actually physically go to their house. All these things enter into the sort of shrinking down of the front hall. It, it becomes less and less important over time. And uh, also related to this is the elimination, eventually, of the back stair which was the stairway for servants. Now, some of you may have back stairs in your homes, but by and large, during the time period when these houses in Pleasant Ridge were built, back stairs were disappearing because people just weren't having as many servants or weren't having servants at all anymore. There's also a trend towards simpler decoration and less furniture. And this is a contrast between the uh, Victorian parlor on the lower right and the modern living room from 1920 on the left. And uh, you can see some dramatic differences in terms of just uh, simpler designs. There's a lot less going on in the wallpaper, in the carpets, in the furniture. Even the legs of the chairs are simpler and less carved and ornamented. And overall, this is tied into the efficiency movement and the growing informality in American society and the whole idea that uh, your house should be simpler and cleaner, less cluttered. Uh, one thing in particular that in the early 1900s, they started to talk about experts and architects and, and uh, doctors and such, was that the old Victorian house was uh, particularly bad for illnesses, that all the clutter, well, let me paraphrase this by saying, back in those days, they had an inaccurate uh, understanding of how germs spread. And so, for instance, they thought that germs would attach themselves to dust and then just lay there and wait forever until you touched it, and then you would get sick. So they had part of the story right, but not all of it. Uh, so there's a lot of literature at this time about uh, clean and bright windows, natural light, letting as much of that into your house as possible, because the sunlight will kill the dust germs. But the other problem is that the Victorian house has all these knickknacks and doodads and, and nooks and crannies, and uh, they just pick up dust. And so it's just like a, a, a den of illness waiting for you. So if you get rid of all that junk and all that clutter and simplify, there's less opportunity for you to get sick. And this is really, really an important part of uh, interior design during this era. But it's also a push that's coming from people who are interested in the arts and crafts and the simplicity movement, you know, getting rid of everything that you don't need, making it easier for you to clean your house because you probably don't have servants anymore. Uh, it's a healthier house as well. All this enters into this sort of sweeping away of a lot of the, the junk of the Victorian type house. Open floor plans become a significant aspect of houses during this time period, where you have the Victorian house, which is characterized by very distinct units, rooms as distinct units that can easily be separated off 
from the other rooms. Uh, I show you these two black and white photos which are looking into parlors and in both cases you have curtains that can be pulled across an entryway or a doorway that's not that wide. Uh, in other cases you just had simple doors that would close and it would shut the room off from everywhere else. And the Victorian house really was a collection of boxes, individual little boxes inside of a big box. Well, once you get into the 20th century, more and more architects and uh, uh, sociologists are starting to talk about opening up that floor plan. And Frank Lloyd Wright is the one that really becomes uh, associated with the drive for the open plan, breaking down the barriers between rooms but it is really out there in the culture. And so you can see it in some of your houses as well, where uh, the houses that you occupy have rather large passages between rooms, and there's an openness in some of them, where you can see across a couple of rooms or across a hall into another room. Whereas in the old Victorian houses of just a few decades earlier, that would have been very closed off and boxy, and, and they dissuaded the idea of opening up rooms. There was more of a closing off mentality back then. But that all begins to change in the early 20th century to the point where now, uh, as you know, uh, houses are being built that, with floor plans that, uh, particularly first floors, that are just sort of completely open, where the kitchen flows into the living room, flows into the other room, it all flows together, and there's a real minimalization of walls as much as possible. That all begins back during this time. More efficient kitchen designs, as I mentioned, uh, there's a drive towards uh, making kitchens smaller because the assumption is that middle and upper class women are going to have less domestic help. Oh, can you go back one? Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, and so since the woman in the house is going to have to do the cooking herself and the serving, uh, let's shrink down the kitchen, make everything within reach if possible, make the distance between the table and the kitchen as short as possible. Uh, let's use the most modern household technology, and this is part of the efficiency movement as well. Uh, and disappearance of the back stairs, I mentioned, is part of this uh, general change that comes with American families as the servants disappear, as these non-family members disappear from the insides of homes. Changes occur in the rooms. You get rid of the back stairs, the hall becomes less important, and you can open up rooms a little bit more too. Uh, I didn't mention that, but that's considered to be another aspect of uh, why the Victorian home tended to be so closed off and boxy, was that oftentimes you had people who weren't family members living in that house, and so as a way to kind of increase the privacy, you could at least close off the rooms to the servants if you wanted to be alone. Okay, well... I think I've gone on a little farther or longer than I wanted to, but uh, I hope this has all helped you to understand a little bit more about the houses of Pleasant Ridge, about your own houses and the houses that you see, and uh, hopefully it'll let, help you to look at them with a little bit different eye. Uh, if I didn't show your house again, I, I apologize. It's just too many. You know, it's, a, it's a too many to deal with. I, I had to choose, and, and it was excruciating, even when I'm deciding which four Colonial Revival houses to show, because I've got about 20 that are all great. So You should be very proud of yourselves, uh, not only in terms of the fact that you have such a great collection of architecture here, but that you take care of it, and that you are able to uh, keep it up and to demonstrate continued interest in the architecture of the community. That's really rare, and I think it's really admirable. So. I could go on and talk about this for another couple hours, but we really need to stop. Um, and we're going to open it up for questions and answers for anyone, but uh, thank you for having me. Hi, my name is Carol Zupian. I'm the chairman of your historical commission, and we'd like to now open this up for some questions and answer, Professor Geyer. Anybody have any questions? I think you answered everything. <laughs> There's a memory over there. Yes. Uh, so, so a little bit of front of mind, too. Were the original Cape Cod homes, the classic Cape Cod homes, did they tend to be large or small? Uh, were the original Cape Cod homes large or small? Like the, the real source for Cape Cod? Yeah, the real deal. The... Small. I mean, the, the Cape, uh, actually, I have a picture of one. Oh, yeah, there's one up on the left. 
the, they're based on colonial houses from the 1600s in New England. Um, but it was really a style that was created in the 1930s as a way to bring the colonial revival down in among you know lower uh, lower middle class people essentially it was it was opening up a new market so that people who perhaps couldn't afford a home in a more elaborate style could still say they had something that tied into historic uh, particularly America's historic past but the what's called the Cape Cod in the 1930s and 40s <coughs> is significantly larger than the original houses that were built on Cape Cod in the 1600s from which they're derived. And, and they really don't bear a whole lot of resemblance to those original houses either, other than the uh, steeply pitched roof. But it, it's more of a marketing uh, phenomenon than anything else. Yes, sir? Was there any significant amount of zoning restrictions about building houses in this area? That's a good question, uh, whether there are any zoning restrictions about architectural design in this area. And I honestly don't know the answer. I would think not in terms of style, given the time frame. That's something that seems to have come in much later. Uh, back then, it was just sort of uh, accepted, more than anything else, that uh, you know, if you have a community and it includes a certain you know, size lot and a certain square footage of house, then everybody sort of agreed to what was the appropriate styles or the appropriate image for their house. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.